Back in 1996, the Lord and Saviour of the PlayStation Core had arrived. That's right, Naughty Dog. Ooh, yeah. And it was thanks to them that the PlayStation brand became a household name. They gave Sony that Mario rival that they were really itching their Naughty Dogs over. The original Crash Trilogy and CTR are, to put it bluntly, class. And I'm pretty sure most people agree with me on that. But, um, and I mean, like, Naughty Dog were so good that Sony just went, Yeah, we're buying you, lad. We're buying you and you're going to keep making games for us until you bankrupt and shit. So with the Crash series essentially, you know, over, or a bit worse than death, Naughty Dog ventured out to make a brand new 3D platformer for the next console in the PlayStation family. Yes, ladies and gentlemen, that's right, the greatest gaming console of all time. The game console I wasn't allowed because Santa Claus told me to stop beating up the kids at my school. The PlayStation 2. After that ad right there, I knew it. I knew it then and there that it was my destiny to buy this console. I mean, that is brand confidence right there. Think about it. Like, they were so confident with it, they decided to feck and sign the tail of the shit out of that ad. Like, it was amazing. And I'm pretty sure that is the reason why I have never puked at all in the 21st century. So thank you, PlayStation. You've kept me clean. And the day I got the console, oh, it was truly a momentous day. I'm pretty sure any person who's gotten a PlayStation 2 in the early 2000s, that was a momentous day for you. And if you are one of those people, I salute you. But anyway, uh, for me personally, it was actually an amazing day because I also got fucking Jaffa Cakes, boy. And you know when you get Jaffa Cakes, that's when you're sorted. So with me Jaffa Cakes ready on hand, it was time to see what Naughty Dog had ready for the uh, um, third place. Jack and Daxter, the Precursor Legacy. This game is pretty class, if you don't mind me being a wee bit blunt. It was Naughty Dog's attempt at Mario 64ing with uh, interconnected worlds, satisfying control, and some goofy high jinky shit to top it off. This video is going to be uh, somewhat of a retrospective. I'll be going through all of the game's worlds and uh, giving my critique. I would make this a full let's play, but honestly I'm terrified at the idea of trying to find that, you know, one feckin' precursor orb and everyone finding out that I'm a hack. So get yourself cozy, get yourself a drink if you need it, and also a few crips, as we look into Jack and Daxter, the precursor legacy. Jack and Daxter follows the exploits of a young lad named Jack, a greed blonde haired young teenager who loves adventure and stealing boats off Batman. Yeah, I'll get into that later. And Daxter, Jack's best friend who's got a proper bug in his stomach in that intro. After their boat ride, they land on Misty Island, the home of the Lurkers, the, um, the antagonist faction of the game. And man, I always loved their designs. And until I made this video, I never knew they actually had, you know, tiny wee pupils. For some reason, I always thought their eyes were just a solid yellow. So, uh, yeah, that's neat. Nice one. Only three minutes in and I'm already going off topic. The duo make their way to this room with a massive evil pit inside, and after a quick scuffle with this mad lad, Daxter falls into it and, um... Man, that stung! I told you we shouldn't have come here, and you listened! What? I'm fine. I'm fine. So yeah, Daxter fell into this pit known as Dark Eco, which is one of the many elements of the Jack universe. Well, element might not be the right word. Think of Eco as like the... 
the life energy of the world. Yeah. So uh, eco comes in many flavors, and you don't ever really want to go near that dark eco. Daxter, who is, you know, rightfully a wee bit upset over Jack's proper fuck up this evening, decides enough is enough. So they go back home and admit that their antics, that they went too far this time with them uh, antics, like, you know? It is at this point we meet um, Samos the Sage, you know, the uh, Sage of Green Eco, and his daughter Kira, who is not a sage. <clears throat> she tells us her first objective, obtain 20 power cells to power up a shielding mechanism in her trademark invention, the Zoomer. But for now, good owl Samos doesn't even trust the lads to get out of the village by themselves. You two couldn't find your way out of the village without training! <laughs> Which, in all honesty, I kind of find hilarious since they had no problem not being in the village earlier. Help! Shit. But yeah, they probably should find a few alternative directions. Anyway, off to Tutorial Island. So, let's get down to that proper good shit. The gameplay. Jack and Daxter is a good old 3D collectathon with all the bells and whistles you'd expect, collecting an X amount of an item in an, in this case, a magical flying ball shaped things known as power cells, in order to press onward in the adventure to find the sage Gol Acheron and to turn that orange little furry friend of ours back into a normal friend. Now let's get into control. And Jack? Yeah, Jack is such good fun. I always forget that the Precursor Legacy is so much more crack to go back to and to just mess around with Jack's really fluid and really responsive moveset. Your basic jump is obviously what you're going to be doing for most of the game, but Jack has all kinds of flavour to add to his jump. Like every video game character in a 3D space that isn't Mario, Jack is able to double jump, but it is his other jumps that you get to some proper good shit. We got a high jump you can do from a crouching position. Obviously handy because, well, it's a high jump. You've got a proper forward moving one there that's well handy for covering far distances. And you think that's all the jumping Jack can do? Ha ha, ha ha. Well, you'd be surprised, lad. Jack has a lot of ways that he can fling up there. Pressing jump right after landing down from a roll will have Jack instantly do a high jump without having to get down on the ground first. You can do an uppercut jump that can be done by a crouch or by punching and then following it up with the jump. You can use this tech to cover even further distances. Absolutely mad. There's also this like uh, speed running tech you can do where like if you just punch right at the edge and then jump up, Jack can like almost levitate? I don't know, I'm a little afraid to get the Jack speedrunner community angry, but I don't know, he, he goes really fucking high, that's all you need to know. It's called like the boosted uppercut and it is actually really cool but again I can't do it. There's a video about it here by Boomer Streams where he gives a very detailed tutorial on how to do it. I just can't do it because I'm crap. And I just love that. I just love it when a game has all these you know extra techniques that the player can really get the most out of a game that the developers definitely never thought of when they were designing it. Oh shit! Also did I talk about how nice looking the characters and the animations are? Because they're, like, really good, like... I mean, this is something that Naughty Dog has always been distinctive at. They are really good at making the player character animations just super expressionate. Like, Crash's, you know, silly Billy dance. Nathan Drake, the way he doesn't die from all the shit going on around him. The way Joel, you know, gets mad and hurts. <coughs> you know, all that, it's... Naughty Dog are just really good at animation in particular. They've only improved over the years, and that is something I really have to commend them for. But all right, uh, enough gushing about like, you know, all the, um, all the good stuff, you know, the animation and like, let's get to the main adventure. Geyser Rock is a very easy going first area to explore. All the collectibles are pretty much right in front of you and it has no enemies in it, so you really are free to just go around and learn the game at your own pace. Samos and Kira also explain how collectibles work via this floating mobile phone yoke. Short version of it is, you need these to press on, you need to dive or uppercut these red boxes to get a wee fly. Collecting seven of those wee flies gets you another one of these. These are currency, and way too many of these are needed in order to just get one fucking block of health that you're probably just going to die over getting anyway. Don't worry, I'll avenge you! What? 
Anyway, after training is complete, you're required to get 20 power cells in order to cross the fire canyon. Simple enough a job. Good training, boys. But that's nothing compared to the challenges that lie ahead. And uh, no problem. We got the moves, eh, Jack? We'd love to stay in chat, Big Green, but we're uh, itching to get on with our adventures. Jack and Axer is just one of the most chill games ever, thanks to its first location, Sandover Village. It is a very relaxing background, and I just find environments like this very inviting, with its, you know, proper 6th gen water. And well, you know, the amount of colour that you can see about the place. It's mad. Anyway, you meet a load of folk around here, so let's see what's making them all dire. We got Jack's uncle here, an explorer, who's getting ready for his adventure. He needs 90 precursor orbs. Voila. Oh wait, I haven't actually talked about them uh, power cell animations yet, have I? Yeah, some of these are really cool. Got Daxter breakdancing, you got him, yeah, doing the robot, and you also have him catching the power cell and giving it to Jack. I like these. They're well good, like. Anyway, I went off topic again. Lovely. Uh, next we have the mayor. 90 orbs, just like before, but he also gets us another power cell for uh, doing his job for him. He's a bit of a twat, but you know, he does give us two power cells, so yeah. We got this bird lady who wants us to punch a massive egg off a fucking cliff. A sculptor looking for his golden cat, and this farmer who wants me to punch these cows in the arse to get them into a pen. <laughs> Sandover Village has two connecting areas, a beach and a jungle. And like, and like to be honest, like, um, these two areas are actually my two favorite areas in the entire game. And I'm pretty sure that's actually not an unpopular opinion. Although I could be wrong, like. Alright, let's start with the jungle. The Forbidden Jungle is one of the most intriguing locations in the game having almost a bit of a wee mystery to solve with these living cactuses just coming out of the ground and this massive ancient precursor structure we see around it. This location is incredibly dense with things to do and it is thankfully not the kind of place you would get lost in easily. The activities, oh there's something else here too. We got this uh, ancient precursor temple that actually is its own mini level in a level that to be honest the game never really does again. Well, not to this extent. And it really did blow my mind though back then. And even now, actually. The fact that this whole world is as seamless as it is, as in no loading screens except for the one when you start the game up, and then entering the mysterious and somewhat futuristic tech of the precursors like this, and finding out how they live these strange and amazing lives. This shit is great, man, and it makes the universe feel like it has a proper history, you know? It also has the release switch to activate all the blue eco around the land. Also, how have I not talked about the blue eco yet? Well, basically, eco are your power-ups in the game, giving you temporary buffs. Blue eco makes Jack run quick, activate ancient precursor tech, and break boxes. It also has a magnetization ability to pull in items towards you. Good stuff, I. Blue eco is definitely the power-up you'll be using the most of the ecos, and it is actually my favorite one too, because, well, it increases your mobility, and anything that increases your mobility is always a thumbs up for me. All right, let's get back to the temple. The temple actually has like one of three bosses in the entire game. It is actually the only optional one too. It also gives you free orbs if you jump up and down on his head. Good stuff, eh? You then just have to snag this wee bit of blue eco here and then launch yourself with the precursor launcher, which FYI feels brilliant. All right, next in the jungle, we have this uh, fishing mini game and uh, Kevin Conroy voices the fisherman. Yeah, that's what I meant when I said Batman. What do you have in the basket? Nothing to talk about. Them monsters patrolling the ocean took a bite out of me fishing rig. But now they're gobbling up me catch. No matter what I try, I can't seem to catch a single fish in this river. And to be honest, it's still quite mad. I never knew that, and I've played this game two thirds of my life. You get to do this kind of fun fishing mini game with them where you have to catch all the green ones and all the yellow ones and uh, Avoid the purple ones because the purple ones are no good. And it's actually a really fun minigame. And not only do you get a power cell for it, but he also gives you a speedboat. And yes, it is the very same speedboat that, uh, you know, they did just nick off him at the start of the game. But, you know, 
It's well good. Another wee bit you have to do in the jungle is to uh, get the power back in the village. And it is actually pretty easy. All you have to do is connect this like eagle beam to the other eagle beam and then you're done. It's actually quite easy but it is pretty cool to move these tower yokes, whatever the fuck they're called. Anyway, the next area I'm a big fan of is Sentinel Beach. It's got some well gorgeous views, a cannon, and it's the place where I was punching an egg. Oh my! I hope the poor deer's okay. Here's a power cell for your valor. No, no! No, 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 no! Look, isn't that cute? It thinks you're its mama. Your mom? You see any feathers here? It's got some really fun power cell tasks. I mean, some of them are just like mining your own business, but there's like one where you have to punch a pelican to try and get it after he gallops it up, and there's another where you have to scare a bunch of seagulls into causing an avalanche. <laughs> Man, they're dicks to birds. I also love this wee little uh, brain teaser or Better yet, kind of a puzzle that's here where you have to like uppercut these pillars upwards in order to make some platforms. Okay, now that I'm saying it, this might not have actually been a puzzle and it was actually just common sense. I don't know man, I was a really stupid kid. Anyway, yeah, Sentinel Beach. It's absolutely class. Let's move on. Yep. That's right, those absolute mad lads decided to go back to Misty Island. Why? Well, Samus told them that they have to stop these Dark Eco silos from opening up, because if they open up, the entire world will be flooded with Dark Eco. And you know what? That would be pretty shite. Misty Island though is, again, one of the better areas of the game. Has a creepy atmosphere, has some of the more interesting platforming challenges in the game, with these cute little barrel Donkey Kong yokes chasing that golden cat, the sculptor's wee pet. And it's also the first place you ride a zoomer if you didn't do the fire canyon first. And it's pretty cool. Except it's also awkward. I know, the zoomer, the zoomer for the most part is pretty grand. It's a bit loose and floaty for the most part. Well, like, look at it like it's, it's floating off the air. But for the most part, it's pretty grand to use. You're only... You only have to like use it essentially like three times and most of the time they're in linear hallways. It's grand. It's just a misty island one I'm not the biggest fan of. Like those fellas that are floating away there, they can be proper gobshites. Another thing introduced in Misty Island is the second eco power-up, Red Eco. And guess what? Red Eco's pretty shit. It makes your attack stronger. So basically, do you know that one guy who takes two hits to kill? He takes one hit to kill. Class. Misty Island also has this one odd bit where you get ambushed and are given Red Eco by fallen enemies during the arena. The combat is pretty simple and you're not likely going to have too much trouble regardless. Because, you know, you have Red Eco. Woohoo! Like, don't get me wrong, there is actually a satisfying momentum to Jack's movement, like doing that uppercut, doing a dive right on top of an enemy, it all feels really fun to do. I just find it weird that they decided to have one area really emphasising on combat. Act okay, hang on, there is... Wait, no, there is Boggy Swamp. With Misty Island now out of the way, it's time to get out of Sandover Village and move on to the next locale. And to do that, we have to cross the Fire Canyon. Be careful. The shield will only protect your zoomer till it reaches 500 degrees, so try to keep her cool. Flying over open lava will definitely heat you up fast. Hit 500 degrees and it's over. Over? Like burning molten metal over? The fire canyon gets pretty hot, so keep a lookout for jumps to keep you off the hot ground. I've also released several blue cooling balloons you can use to drop the shield's temperature quickly. Right, so basically we have to cross Fire Canyon before Jack and Axter get a little bit too toasty. Fire Canyon is thankfully not that difficult. Just follow the straight path, try not to go over the overly yellow hot bit, otherwise your heat gauge will go up faster, and hit those cooling balloons on the way. Easy stuff. You can also still get the power cell from collecting all the flies in this area, which is actually pretty sweet. So you can get the power cell for collecting all the flies, and then you can get the power cell for finishing Fire Canyon. 
two power cells for the price of one if you're smart like I was not one of those people I just missed one of the flies so I had to go back yay right now that I'm done with that little galvant let's head to the next hub area rock village Rock Village is the home locale of the Sage of Blue Eco, and it is some place, all right. Very cluttered. Hey! It looks like the Blue Sage threw a party. Oh my! Rock Village is on fire! One heck of a party. It is very gritty, very dark, very on fire. You know, this isn't your just little baby playground, Sandover Village with its lovely bright greens. We're now in dark green territory. You're in the danger zone now, fellas. After Samos and Kira are at the hut, you venture into Rock Village and you meet all sorts of characters. You meet a geologist who is trying to save these little wee mole fellas. You meet a superhero who got a bonk to the head. And you meet a professional gambler who's wearing a barrel for trousers. Way. And what is that, 90 orbs? You two find me 90 precursor orbs. Bring me 90 orbs. Bring me 90 precursor orbs and I'll let the partoons loose. Hey. Thankfully, however, that is not all you're asked to do by them. As your one, and that other one, they ask you to go to Precursor Basin for a few wee tasks. An all Zoomer level. Well, lovely. I know, it's, it's a nice wee little playground to mess around with your Zoomer. It's safer than Misty Island anyway, because um, there's not death everywhere. Uh, this is also where you have to actually lure those mole people I was talking about earlier. Um, it's easy stuff, all you have to do is lure them into that big old hole there and you're all done. You have to do this uh, wee spot of gardening as well for Samos, and to be honest, it is way harder than it should be. I don't know, I'm just shit, probably the latter. Also, we gotta talk about them rings because those rings were a box. As a matter of fact, on the script, I really emphasized that they were a box. I circled around it three times. I wrote the script back in April, but geez, it must have really pissed me off. If that awkward silence wasn't evident enough, I really hated the ring challenge. I'm in general not a big fan of ring challenges in any kind of game. Um, I hated them in uh, Harry Potter and the Philosopher's Stone on PS1, and I sure as feck hate them here too. And finally, you have to do that little favour for the gambler, which is to just beat this record time around a racetrack. Again, relatively easy shit. Right. A ways with you, Zoomer. It's time to play some platformy shit again. So, where are we heading next? I hear you echoing through the device of your choice that you're watching this video on. Well, we're heading to Boggy Swamp. Okay, so let's get this out of the way. Boggy Swamp is well good. It is here we get introduced to the third and final eco power-up, Yellow Eco. And you're probably wondering, is it as bad as Red Eco, or is it as good as Blue Eco? Well, I'm happy to confirm, it's neither or, but it is definitely well worth your time like. As you can see, it makes Jack shoot fireballs out of his palm. It's pretty badass like, and you can also aim it in first person view. Which, I forgot to mention, you're able to use the first person view. You only ever have to use it like twice in the game, but you know what? I'm actually doing a thumbs up but you can't see it. fuck. While I do love this level, it can admittedly be a bit samey at times because the environment doesn't really have any distinctive locales to make it very different from one another except for caves and swampy shit in caves again, you know? Yellow Eco gets an absolute shitload of usage in this level though. Well obviously it would, it's the first time you use it, but uh, like you have to help this hillbilly boy right here uh, save his little wee pet cat yoke. And do you remember that bird that uh, we thought we killed by dropping an egg down? You end up using it as a mount. It's called a flop flood. And it's actually really fun to ride. You you can get this like little miniature glide out of it. He can charge. He can also shoot the fireballs. And he's great out crack. And he can jump like a fucker. Boggy Swamp is definitely not shy of variety. Whether you're protecting these mushrooms here or you're trying to stop this robot from raising up from the mud. You're definitely not going to be short on variety, but it is a shame it 
is very easy to get lost in it. Or maybe I just have a bad sense of direct. Actually, never mind. I just have a bad sense of direction. This level is fantastic. All right, we have one last spot to venture towards before we can get out of Rock Village. The Lost Precursor City. I know I've said it a few times by now, but this is another one of my favorite levels in the entire game because it has some tight platforming height. And even though it may not be the most practical city, you know, with its electrical water and the like, it is still a very visually beautiful area with its warm blue colors, and I especially love the soundtrack here. Now, I'm no music expert or anything like that, but uh, yeah, <laughs> music's good. What else do I like about this level? Uh, oh yeah, it has this um, gorgeous wee slide you go down, and after that you get chased by this rising dark eco pit. It's scary stuff, but it's well fun. Another wee challenge that sticks to the memories is this one involving the jars. You press this button and the power cell or the scout fly goes through a pipe and you have to rush before the time runs out. Well intense high. And when you're done in this big owl city, you can use this blue eco here to charge these orb things in order to take the submarine back to the surface. Very convenient. And of course, you get another power cell up on the top of it as a nice little gift. Good on you. With us now back on the surface, we've gathered enough power cells in order to press onward. So we head off to this big owl machine here to see what the crack is. Great! You have the cells for the machine! They ought to provide enough power to lift that boulder! There we go! Now be careful facing that monster lurker at the top! Wait! Uh, I'll stay here and protect Kira! Jack? I think you're ready to handle that monster without me. Oh, really heroic of you. Alright, boss battle time. Do you remember that warrior fella I told you who got the shit kicked out of him? Or as I mistakenly refer to him, a superhero in the live action bit that I don't want to re-record. Yeah, well, Claw, this fella here, was the one who caused it. So why don't we go and give his ass a proper kicking? So, as you can see, Claw is a pretty massive fucker. It's pretty self-explanatory how to beat him. All you have to do is step on the platform that he doesn't hit with the flame boulders, and then, when you get the opportunity, use the blue eco, leg it over to him, use the yellow eco, pew pew away, run away to fuck, rinse and repeat, and then you're done. Well done. Right, good luck to your rock village. Now, let's press onwards and- <laughs> Ah, shite. Right, so these flying little purple pricks here have set a bomb at the end of this pathway. If we don't get to it before they do, they're gonna blow it up to fuck. You just gotta outrun them on the zoomer. It's actually well fun because you get to pick up these blue eco charges and the blue eco actually stays as long as you keep the acceleration. You can finish that entire track without hitting the brakes if you're good enough. I'm not that good enough. But if you are that good enough, go for it, you mad lad, you. I love this stage, man. It has far more risk and intensity than the boss right beforehand, due to the fact it has a time aspect and, well, you know, shit can go pretty bad in it. We finally have some important story stuff happen in the next area. Gaul Acheron was revealed to be that owl fella from the intro, and he is joined by his sister, Maya. Gaul is infected with the Dark Eco, and he plans to nuke the world by essentially opening up a Dark Eco silo. <laughs> Wait a minute! That was Gull? The same Gull who's supposed to change me back? Gull is the guy trying to kill us? I'm doomed. Now the duo have a new task. To stop Gull and Maya from destroying the world, and to, hopefully, still get them to turn Daxter back to normal. So, what's next? A few more power cells and your Zoomer heat shield. Yes, so more adventure in a way. And Volcanic Crater is honestly not as nice a hub as Rock Village at all. And stand over a village? <laughs> Go away with yourself. There's not much to do in Volcanic Creator, other than the odd bits and bobs you could already do in any other hub area, but there is another bartering section here. It's only with these two fellas though. They have a total of four power cells, which you can get for 90 orbs each. Thankfully, this is easy to do if you're very good at collecting shit and scabby at spending orbs. 
Now, we do still have an odd bit of level before we take on Gollum Maya, so let's hop on these really unreliable and shy carts as we head to Spider Cave. Alright, I'm just going to be blunt here. I do not like Spider Cave. Okay, while I do enjoy navigating some of its locations, especially that big owl robot area, I do find the place as a whole annoying, hard to navigate, and just not fun. And yeah, I know I'm probably in the minority of this, but don't get me wrong, there is still some good shit in Spider Cave. The yellow eco is used again, you have to use that first person view, and it's awkward because the aiming's inverted. Sweet. And shit, yeah, it also has the, the legendary hidden power cell. Oh boy. Well, it's technically not in Spider Cave, it's kind of just at the edge of Volcanic kind of Crater into Spider Cave. But okay, okay. Basically, there's this one power cell right at the entrance to Spider Cave from Volcanic Crater where you can see a little metal box that's like in a corner. And to get it, you have to get some yellow eco, roll your ass down and try and climb these edges and then shoot the fireball right at that power cell. This is actually the most distinctive power cell of my entire childhood because when I discovered it, I thought I broke the game. I thought there was only 100 power cells, but it turned out there was 101. And man, no one believed me. Or cared. And yeah, I hear you asking, but sure, Kyle Wolf, why did you not just check in the pause menu where you could have seen it was a grey power cell slot? But my answer to that? I don't know. There is, thankfully, more crack to be had in Spider Cave other than frustration. There's this one area here that is completely dark, and in order to light it up you have to whack these crystals in order to see. It's fun, also frustrating, but I guess that's par for course in this damn level, isn't it? Anyway, moving on. Snowy Mountain. Possibly the second best level of the entire game. This level right here is also the most sandboxy that isn't a uh, hub area, if that makes sense. Oh, Sentinel Beach is also very... Fuck it, this one is. This area, oh man, this area is so fun to explore. You can get lost somewhat easily... Siri just went off, what the fuck? But yeah, you can get lost pretty easily. The area is very dense with things to do though, thankfully. We get reminded that Red Eagle exists when we have to use it against these glacier gobshites. There is also this massive deadly lurker fortress that you can enter. Which is actually pretty sweet. It makes Snowy Mountain have this kind of grandiose sense, feeling like a really big place, having it be a place within a place. You know what I mean? I, I, you know, I think you know what I mean. This locale also has some pretty clever secrets about. It is a very collect-a-thon -y location. I know, shocker in a game, that's all about this. But we also have these weird precursor, um things. Blockers? Oh shit, wait, that's actually what they're called. This can be pretty awkward. You have to jump on these buttons here and avoid touching the force fields around it. Yeah, simple, but ice physics. If you're well clever looking about as well, you can also find the yellow eco vent here. You can even see the generator from underneath this ice here. Really nice touch. The second and only other flut flut segment of the entire game is here too. Unlike Boggy Swamp, which was a more explorative area to use the flood flood, this one is just a straight, get there, hurry up to fuck before those platforms fall. It isn't extremely difficult, but if I'm being honest, I think this is a better usage of the flood flood than the Boggy Swamp area. But yeah, Snowy Mountain is another one of those levels that's a proper thumbs up for me. One of the higher tier levels, that's for sure. Now, let's get out of this cold spot. And now... Finally, we're on our way to the end game. After compiling enough power cells, we're on our way to Golomaya's Citadel. But first, we have to get on that zoomer one last time and go through the lava tube. Let's go. Just like with Fire Canyon, you have to make sure you hit the cooling balloons in order to make sure the zoomer stays cool. Another new thing here is that the zoomer can actually be charged with yellow eco and fire them rapidly. It's pretty cool, although you don't do it too much. Lava Tube has a lot of stuff going on. First you're going through lava, then you're going through this room with spinning ball things, and then you're shooting these dark eco boxes everywhere, and then you're going around ramps. There's a lot going on in Lava Tube's level design, but thankfully it isn't too overwhelming. So you know, it gets a thumbs up for me. Ah, fuck it, it's actually my favorite zoomer level, yeah. 
Anyway, when you open the portal for Samos and Kira, you're unfortunately treated to some bad news. It's terrible! Father is missing! I think Gaul and Maya may have kidnapped him as well! Relax, sweetheart. I got everything under control. Under control? Lurker armies continue to grow across the land. The sages have been kidnapped. Gaul and Maya have gathered enough eco to complete their terrible plan. And to stop them, you're going to have to fight your way through their citadel. Uh, yeah. That about uh, sums it up. All right, everyone. Here we go. Final level time. It's been some fucking journey, hasn't it? With Samos now in captivity alongside all the other sages of Eco, it is now up to these two mischievous bastards in order to stop Gull and Maya from activating this giant evil precursor robot. And how do they possibly do that? Well that's simple, all they have to do is free the sages. But maybe also, you know, they could break some shit. I mean, I'm pretty sure they're, you know, not supposed to be here. I mean, like look, they weren't supposed to be in Misty Island. Ah! Okay, yeah, sorry, I won't do that again, I promise, I promise. Anyway, yeah, Golemaya Citadel, it's a pretty class level. It has by far the strongest platforming challenges of the entire game. But man, I love the platforming challenges. It has, okay, one I really like is this one where you press a button and uh, there's some colored platforms. When you step on the platforms, they fall down. Granted, it's not original, but with the controls as tight as they are, it's really fun. Another one I like is uh, this Blue Eco Launchpad one. Usually the launch pads are uh, stationary, but this time around they're actually moving. It's not difficult per se, but it can be a little scary trying to, you know, land right on it without falling to your death. And Red Eco, it exists. Every sage you rescue also has a unique cutscene. I like the yellow sages one the most because he calls Daxter a muskrat. Who would have thought I'd live to see the day when I needed to be rescued by a boy and his muskrat? <sighs> I'm gonna give Gaul and Maya a little payback! When you finally rescue Samos, you're unfortunately put into a spot of bother when Gaul and Maya manage to activate the Precursor robot. So you know what that means? Time for the Owl's final boss. Jack! Take the elevator up and stop that robot! So we take this massive elevator up to our showdown. Yep. This right here is the final boss. I wouldn't say it is too bad a final boss at all really, but I wouldn't say it's anything all too fancy either all the same. It has multiple phases where you know you shoot it in the face and then you, you fling yourself up into the air. You fight what I think could be something like Dark Eco Lurkers or jumping a tiny bit ahead here but maybe something that's like the Dark Makers? I'm not 100% sure what they are but you can only kill them with the Yellow Eco. It's pretty intense stuff. You won't have to worry about them for too long though, as soon as you see this white cluster of light, you're all sorted. Light Eco! It does exist! They must not be allowed to get it! Light Eco! That could be the stuff to chain me back! Or, it might stop that robot. Hmm. Stay fuzzy, save the world. Choices. Okay, fine! We'll save the world, but do it quickly before I change my mind! After this, all you have to do is grab the white eco and enjoy the show. There we go, all sorted. Yep, Gaul and Maya just fell into a huge vat of dark eco with their fates unknown. During the celebration, Samos even ponders if we'll ever see these villains again. Lol. Yeah, it's a pretty happy ending overall. Yeah, Daxter did stay an Otso, so they technically failed their objective, but you know what? He's a pretty cute bastard, so who gives a shit? In conclusion though, Jack and Daxter is all in all a fantastic game and all that. The game is pretty short, and even if you are the completionist sort, you're likely not going to struggle all too much as the game is quite easy for the most part, and none of the collectibles are too hidden, 
except for that one that I told you about earlier in Spider Cave. The zoomer levels might also cause a tiny bit of bother, but if you're patient enough, it's not too bad. Just remember that you can jump with L1. Always do it when you're about to go up a ramp and you're going to be flying away. You'll see. The eco power-ups are another thing I wish got a bit more love. Blue eco is the only one you use throughout pretty much the entire game. Now I know I've made jokes about it a lot, but red eco I just didn't find that useful at all. And yellow eco is great, but I, I don't know, maybe just one more eco power-up? I don't know. And what do you get for completing the entire adventure? Well, let's find out. Holy yakko! What could that be? Wow! It's an ancient precursor door! It looks like it will only open if we fill all 100 holes with power cells. Uh, we're heroes, remember? We have 100 power cells. The Naughty Dog logo. Fucking A. Yeah, it's a pretty shit ending. You just get a white screen. That's it. I don't really know what I would have wanted. I don't know. Maybe they could have just... Since you 100 percent the game, maybe they could have just let you break the game. Maybe have infinite blue eco. Infinite red eco for all the three people who will care. Infinite yellow eco would actually be really cool. <laughs> okay. I like how I am... Um, I like how I said that I didn't know what I would have wanted and then I just say that, but... I think you guys get what I mean. But with that all said, Jack and Axe through the Precursor Legacy is still a fantastic game. And you have to remember too, Naughty Dog had a lot of pressure. They made the Crash series before this. They already set really high standards for themselves, and in my opinion, they actually did manage to exceed them. So fair play, Naughty Dog. So, where could the series go from here? Where could they actually take Jack and Daxter next? Maybe Golamaya returns sooner than we think. Maybe there's like this all-out lurker war. Well, for anyone who has played the sequels, I'm pretty sure they'd all agree that no one saw what it would become. Shoot that thing! Shoot it! <laughs> pretty fucking metal.